Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zurück. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the coffee break. Now we're leaving the academic part and go to the practical world. So we will have the first real case of um, joint audit, which is the International Tax Audit Forum here. So that means international tax audits and external audits play an important role here. That's why it's a matter of course that we will start with the experience report from international um, external tax audits. Before we do that, we have a little surprise for you because the EU Provisio, um, on the basis of which we're working on, has become active in 2013. And that does not mean that the International Joint Audit does not have a longer past or history. We have a, a small video that we prepared for the very, very first audit of Bavaria and Austria. And let's watch it. Earlier in 1965, the tax auditor had problems um, of in auditing external relationships, international relationships. So the auditor referred um, to the former financial director in Nuremberg, Friedrich Hassel, was responsible for the auditing of foreign relationships. He received the order to take a look at the case more precisely, and he said that a company made um, plastic um, items made from plastic granulate, and at some point, um, they also made um, Christmas balls for that. They used a thin foil that they received from Switzerland. The problem was that the production and the sales of these uh, Christmas balls led to substantial losses. And um, now invoices were sent from the Swiss company about the deliveries of these foils. Another case become even more international. And then I found that the taxpayer um, had um, established a company in Austria together with a guy from Salzburg, and they made um, Christmas balls in Austria and sold them in Austria. And of course, that's why I was interesting. What was the profit they made in Austria? That's why he sent an information request to the financial authorities in Aust Austria, but um, they were not able to answer that with um, risk, uh, request from the tax files. But they, they were ready. They said um, if, we, if we wanted to make a, perform an external audit with the company, and um, then also after the third day, then an auditor from Bavaria could take part in the external audit. So that's how in 1965, we had the first joint tax audit between Austria and Bavaria. Friedrich Hassel discusses this proposal with his um, bosses and also provides all the, prepares all the tax audit. Then the financial authority of Salzburg was responsible and the auditor started on a Monday and then I met the auditor on Wednesday. Then we drove to the company. So, actually, would have to use um, public transportation, but um, our Austrian colleague had a car, and he was so nice to take me. And but the car was really old; it was a really old Beetle. But we always came there safely. Then everything was done, like domestically, buying the bolts in Switzerland, preparing production of the bolts in Austria and sales of the um, bolts in Austria, and then permanent losses. The Austrian companies did not have any additional income in order to balance out these uh, this uh, loss. That's why the money of the Austrian shareholder was used up. and. Um, he um, 
rejected to pay more, and then he left the company. And uh, so we um, found out that the shareholder that had terminated received an action by court. And so the Austrian um, colleague said that we should come to a meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning to Salzburg. Everything worked fine. And our guy came, and he reported that he was in Switzerland. And then he re, um, informed, was informed by the administrative board that the company was um, established a few years ago. So ever since, no faults for the vaults and nothing else were prepared. So he talked about all the details and then he went to Liechtenstein. And then he received, and knew that this institution was set up a few years ago and then um, established a Swiss company. Shares have been held by a Liechtenstein um, solicitor on a trust base is for the German taxpayer. And he had written confirmations, and I wanted to make copies, which was not possible. It's not um, that our partner would have legal concerns about using these letters for um, official purposes, but it was also because uh, only the case because um, the financial authority did not have any photocopier. Then we went to the city center who made the photocopies. It was on a Saturday. It was lovely late summer weather, and I was looking forward to having a nice weekend in Salzburg. But things turned out to be different, and uh, um, partner said that he knows the financial authority from Salzburg quite a long, and that they have to take care of the funds. And that's why he brought one copy for the German and of the for the Austrian financial authority. And then Monday, on Monday, Friedrich Hasselt reported to his boss in, in Nuremberg, and then he said, of course, it has to be done by the tax um, investigation authority. So by taking over the case by the tax investigation authority, my first international tax audit was ended, and this is also the end of my little report about this tax audit. All right. So since I'm the only one from the team that is, uh, still remembers 1965, you know, back then, my father was trying to explain the difference um, where Sir Stanley Matthews is a legend and Cassius Clay is not a legend as yet, and James Bond would never become a legend. That's why it's nice to see that I'm standing here and can also welcome a legend to the stage, our James Bond the Oscar for the financial um, authority films goes to Friedrich Hasselt. This is how more than 50 years of the audits in Bavaria looks like. So you can see he's in great shape. Yeah, everything went fine. How was that 50 years ago in Salzburg? Oh, I still remember these four days. It was lovely. The Austrian colleagues um, assisted me and supported me excellently during the audit. And, well, the um, success of this audit was basically due to the good cooperation between Austria and Germany. That, of course, includes the Bavarian financial authorities as well. And you can see that we laid a great foundation stone for the co cooperation that still continues. And I do hope you all liked the film and showed that we are deeply rooted in history and that we're all working on the shoulders of large personalities, of great personalities like Friedrich Hasselt. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you have to carry that burden. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. If I at all now um, will bring your bouquet of flowers for you. Yes, I would like to 
say thanks, and it's a great honor for us to have you here today. Now it stands, the old guy's leaving. That's what the script says, and now I'm leaving. Now we're coming back to the international experience from joint law audits from a perspective Germany, Austria, and Sweden. Our speakers will give a practical case um, that relates uh, to the active and um, that asset and liability law and the reservation of a, um, approval and consent of the taxpayer. We have Mr. Erich Spensberg, he's the head of the International Tax Audit Unit of the Bavarian Tax Office in Munich for International Tax Law, and he also um, teaches at the um, University of Hershey, Hersching, and he's also working at the um, Federal Financial Act um, Academy. I would like to welcome our Austrian our colleague, because we are highly networked, and we had Mr. Steiner here last year on the panel this year. His colleague, Mr. Roland Macho, is going to introduce the case. He's the regional responsible Eastern team leader, larger company auditing. He also works for the Austrian Ministry of Finance in Vienna. That's where he's domiciled, and his focus are the transfer prices, and among others, uh, together with Professor Lam, he teaches at the university. And he uh, um, holds the scientific head at the campus in Vienna. But we're particularly happy to welcome Lisbeth Eriksson. She's the MLC coordinator um, at the Swedish Tax Agency in Sweden. Her the first joint audit in Germany uh, was carried out by her in 1996. Since 2002, she's responsible for international requests. And she's also the teacher and professor for the European Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, Erich Spensberger, Roland Macho, and Lisbeth Eriksson. We can't wait to see you up here. Thank you. Welcome and Chris Gott from my side. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation together with my two colleagues. We would like to explain the success model of international tax law. That's how we called it. Our um, experiences from the joint audits we've gained so far from Germany, Sweden, and Austria. And we'd like to add the legal corrective framework offered in the different countries from daily practice. And we'd like to focus on a practical case, an audit case. Nothing has changed that much under 50 years, obviously. We are dealing with the same questions like our colleagues long times ago. And this is the practical case. And then we will give an outlook from the point of view of the audit on site and the question we see. see. First of all, we'd like to start with the experience from the uh, German tax authorities, the experience we've made so far. First of all, we made very positive experience. So process flows have been improved. And we heard today that after the law was created in 2013, um, we also established the STR in Bavaria just a few weeks after. But beyond that, we were trying to improve considerably in our structure. The special um, audit has been added um, from 35 people to 50 people. We have uh, three new head, heads in our um, authority. Improvements have been made. Our colleagues get all language courses in English once weekly. And these are things that are quite helpful when you work internationally and um, so within the responsibility there was an improvement, but not only in our area, but also for the other participants in this model, um, that is um, the tax authorities in other countries. Structures are being improved also with regard to um, consultation. So there are more and more cases where consultants come to us and we also have information dialogues 
and uh, whether joint audit can be taken care of and on the crest of the companies. So even if you don't have an application law, but we're still willing um, to also um, do this internationally and also to go forward with that. I think we said this um, two years ago that we will receive a BMF letter. So that's an assistance for the legal protectionists, for the tax consultants and also for our colleagues. So we would have been happy if we could have announced this today. But unfortunately, I think we will still receive it this year. There's a draft of this paper. And for those who work with it every day, this should give us a guideline. Let's look at the cooperation with the foreign tax authorities. So far, from Bavarian standpoints, together with Austria, Italy, Netherlands, Croatia, and Sweden, we've made the most cases with these countries. There's a total of 11 different countries where we made joint audits with. And since 2014, when we had the last conference, this has improved considerably. There's hardly any selection meetings necessary. That means this process has speeded up. And so do you also have a, a level of confidence? And once you need you know, um, Roland Macho sends me an email, and if he sends me the case, and he, then I believe if he feels that it is qualified, and after he's, uh, he has worked on so many different cases, then I'm sure that um, we don't need to have a selection meeting before. What I can also say, mostly auditors were seconded based on 10 and 11 of um, the law governing the mutual administrative assistance and tax matters based. Um, we support from, uh, we are um, so distinguishing between active and passive um, audit law. Right, hello Munich. Well, our experience, you know, our experience is positive. We leave away all the negative signs because you learn the most from it. So what are the benefits we see? In Austria, we, have a, we are a federal authority and the, um, for an, uh, the tax authority has been organized in a countrywide and we don't have to discuss whether this or that authority any is competent so locally everything is available and it's rather you know centralized in Vienna and the most cases happening in Vienna in our corporate cooperation with the financial ministry we also have a new team for um, transfer price control where we can use more people and that provides benefits and is also necessary in order to, to cover the topic that Professor Lang mentioned last time. Mostly, I don't only see the case where we have a double, um, a double non taxation. Having a double taxation, I mean, these cases happen and that these might be quite long. Joint audits are an important instrument in order to save resources and time and we call that, um, we have a lot of different legal concepts that we're using for that, And but basically, in joint audits, the cooperation with Bavaria um, was able to save a lot of resources that you can use for other cases. For those cases that um, happened already 50 years ago, we still see these cases today, it is unchanged. And it's not the faults today or any Christmas balls, but uh, you know, that would be technical tools or components or whatever. What's important for us to mention is that we also take care of the vis-a-vis, -vis, and um, that also is important once we have settled joint audits. And if you want to have a correction, and if you want to have a counter-correction in the other state, then it, sometimes it's quite difficult and complex. So you know how it is, and if you have shaped an opinion, and once you've written down your opinion, and um, and if you have defended this opinion towards the taxpayer, if you write the report and put it into the computer, and then the foreign authority says, actually, no. The first thing is to do defending. 
So you have to build up a wall and say, no, that's not the case. And then it takes ages. And that's what you see with the um, processes. And so it's no longer possible um, to think in two or three or four years. And not like Erich Spensberger said, when we have joint audits and a simultaneous audit or whatever we do, that we will be ready in a few months. And that's quite satisfying for two, for both sides, because then there's also, you know, that lies within the interest of the taxpayer. And our interest it is that you only have taxation once and hopefully on the right side of the borders that we still have. And that's our main interest, and that's why we're working on that. Those cases where we are working against other states, where we both believe that we don't get enough, that is most fun for us, of course. And I mentioned that the majority of cases, um, due to the economic framework conditions with Germany and Austria, and basically the um, southern German area and southern Bavaria, and we also have the benefit of the joint language to a certain level. And beyond that, uh, it will be a bit more difficult. And sometimes it's English is the more simpler part. All dialects are pretty similar, but if you uh, have to deal with somebody in northern Germany, you might need uh, mutual assistance. We have similar. Uh, um, regulations. We have implemented uh, the Austrian EU Mutual Assist Administrative Assistance Act, and we found that sometimes there are slight, slight differences, and we might come back to that later. In uh, Germany, most of these procedures are done with multilateral controlling the MLCs. Uh, the term joint ordered is not so well known in Austria. MLC is the term that we work with. And, and on the basis of we, we carry out the procedures with German. And my wish would be uh, we have uh, the Mutual Administrative Assistance Act still exists from 1949. 59, sorry. And this implies uh, cases that are very urgent. And for 35 years, while I've been working as an auditor, I've never heard anything other than that the external audit is very important. It has to be very efficient. So uh, this would be a good case uh, for the within the framework of the uh, Mutual Assistant Act 45. Uh, it would be important to be less formalistic and uh, that we don't have or we get rid of the big obstacles that we can, that we have to have formal applications we have to wait for deadlines and that you have a lot of techni technicalities it would be a lot easier or it is possible that you can just pick up the phone and i think uh, that the a mutual Administrative Assistance Act 45 shouldn't be totally forgotten because it does simplify, uh, simplify quite a lot of things. Hello, everybody. Also, from uh, the Swedish point of view, it's uh, very advantageous to have joint audits and also for the taxpayer. Uh, they see uh, that it's very advantageous if we can ask uh, common uh, uh, questions, uh, that we can invite the taxpayer for common questioning, and they're very happy to do that. That is my experience in any case. Uh, what we call joint audit, or what is called joint audit here, we haven't introduced that legally in Sweden, but that doesn't stop us uh, to carry out joint or simultaneous orders where you invite uh, companies and you carry it out. So, uh, just as my uh, colleague from audit, we call it an MLC, multilateral cooperation, and uh, that works very well. It's uh, just works just as well as if you call it a uh, joint audit. And so far, we've only had it done this with Germany. That doesn't mean we uh, couldn't uh, carry out transfer price audits with other countries. Uh, well, we haven't had any companies uh, so far. I was an auditor before, and uh, uh, 
I did the first simultaneous audit in 1996 with Germany. And I'm sure that's not a coincidence because uh, Germany for us is one of the biggest trade partners. So obviously uh, we have a lot of common cases. So as already mentioned, we didn't introduce a guideline for a joint audit, but nonetheless it works very well even without that. And we're going to continue doing it like that. Uh, sometimes it's very good uh, you do, when you don't have a legal basis and you can still do something. Uh, we would uh, be a bit worried about that. So next uh, we are going to look at the legal uh, correction frame from a German point of view, first of all. And on the next couple of slides, we're going to look who takes the initiative when you have an exchange of information or a joint audit. And if the initiative comes from a journey, we normally don't have a problem because we choose our cases in such a way uh, that uh, they are a secondary audit and uh, within this audit we can always change something. It becomes more problematic if the initiative comes from foreign countries. And it is uh, conceivable uh, that the case is still open. That is often the case because uh, Germany is always a little bit behind with uh, their audits. The other countries are usually faster. Uh, but it is possible that sometimes we are faster and our books are already closed or uh, the uh, case wasn't actually audited externally. And we already have um, legal assessments. Then we have a procedural problem as to how can we deal with it if we have to make uh, changes, especially changes after the closing of an audit, because uh, we have certain things that we need. If uh, there is a need for change on both sides, and as long as we, the Germans, have taken the uh, initiative, we just have a reservation. We voice a reservation. If the initiative comes from a foreign country, uh, then we have a problem. If we have an assessment that is based on evidence, uh, we don't have a problem if we want more taxes or get higher taxes and we change them. We've got legal um, provisos for that or provisions for that uh, so that we can collect more taxes. Even if we have uh, assessments with binding effect. If Germany has to pay tax out, then it's more uh, problematic uh, because then within the framework of a joint audit or an exchange of information, we can't um, make a correction uh, downwards. Uh, we have a certain ruling for that, and it does work. We've had uh, some uh, mutual agreement procedures which were carried out in this, uh, pros in this respect as well, but it is a little bit more difficult in terms of the procedures. And then we've got a certain problem. Uh, in, this, uh, in the case of statutes of limitations, basically uh, this uh, mutual agreement procedure, if it's carried out, enables a correction of assessments, but the correction according to section 175 also works if there are assessment uh, mistakes and uh, there are commentators, well-known commentators, who say that there is no possibility if assessment uh, mistakes were made uh, to make corrections. In 2010, for example, in Germany, uh, the tax file return is filed in 2011 and uh, in 2015, the statute of limitations would have um, expired, and then one wouldn't be able to make a correction. So it hasn't been clarified conclusively, and there are differing opinions uh, that haven't been clarified. So I think that is something that needs to be done. Uh, we also have legal frameworks. We've got MLCs uh, with various countries which we carried out, 
and uh, the understanding of an external audit in Germany and in Austria and in Sweden uh, can't be applied one-on-one -on -one because there are different situations. And as an audit, uh, you have to be able to go through with it. On the one hand, you have to harmonize uh, the atypical situation with the legal stipulations and the existence of information that you have for the uh, other country. Uh, the legal framework in Austria, on the one hand, uh, we have uh, of um, section 6Z6, which is an income tax uh, act. Uh, then we've got procedural possibilities as well as to how um, legally binding assessments can be reopened again. So we have a, this is a big difference compared to Germany. In um, Austria, uh, we have legally binding decisions or rulings. So a, a tax return can be adjudicated very quickly. And it is at the same time easy to reopen such a case. And the in many uh, other countries, we've got cases that are far in the, diff uh, in the past, and then it is uh, difficult to reopen them in Austria. And apart from that, uh, we have a the DBI, the double taxation network, so we uh, can't go beyond that. And in Austria, we've got the paragraph of the Section 48 federal fiscal tax that is often overestimated. Uh, 20, 30 years ago in Austria, one was able to implement that by uh, taking the Section 48 to take certain things out in order to avoid double taxation. All of that is no longer tenable because Austria can't solve all the problems of this world with the Section 48 of the Federal Fiscal Code. So this is only applicable to a certain extent. Um, Section 6 said 6 of the income tax is lays down that there is a general correction that is possible if something went wrong in the transfer pricing went wrong, but that wasn't uh, calculated properly, for example, if we agree with that, uh, then we have to see how we can implement that technically. And this agreement, if you want to call it that, uh, that the company uh, agrees uh, that uh, the facts were defined uh, correctly, but that the conclusions weren't uh, correct in terms of the value, then this can be implemented if the owner of the company from the foreign uh, company accepts that. Uh, then uh, there would be a tax uh, demand in Austria against uh, the foreign company. And we brief the company in writing, and the company then would say it would pay or, or accept a repayment. Then the Section 6 has been uh, updated so that uh, w we now have a – if uh, hidden reserves are realized across a border, then one c the taxation measures have to be implemented. One can pay in installments. And for capital goods, we have a period of seven years. Uh, then Section 6 was dealt with by the administrative cause in Austria as well as uh, terms of, in terms of receivables and liabilities from affiliated companies. And we always refer to the fact uh, that we uh, meet uh, the OECD transfer price uh, principles, and it con contains something else that uh, the financial authority has a dynamic interpretation of the OECD commentary. where the special correction 
regulation within the meaning of Section 8 corporation tax is concerned. If we can uh, prove certain uh, facts, uh, then we assume that there are open or hidden distributions. We look at those and we look at when the distribution uh, took place, how did it happen within the country, how can it be implemented that you have simple taxation. So uh, sometimes uh, you would have a reimbursement or you have a reduction of the source tax. And uh, then we say if there are a margin note of six, uh, fifth, 659, uh, in the event of unreasonably high expenses for the benefit of the shareholder within the framework of a legally valid agreement, uh, such an excessive uh, transfer price in the group can be adjusted. And the ministry can say uh, that this is not based off tax and it can't be implemented. Uh, the Rescindment of or the revocation of Section 299 BAO uh, was mentioned earlier on, and Section 48 means that if we have long-term procedures, for example, if we have mutual agreement procedure, we can have a temporary uh, relief of tax payments in Austria, so the taxpayer since the initiation of the procedure until the closure of the procedure has the possibility that he only has to pay once, uh, taxes once abroad, and in, German, in Austria they are suspended. And then we have section of four, paragraph two of the income tax law in conjunction with uh, 293BO, a correction of periods subject to the statute of limitations. Uh, there are many cases where none of these uh, sections uh, apply, and then we have a regulation which would help us in such cases, and it would help us with the statute of limitations, and uh, that is uh, section 303. If it uh, is true that Austria is not allowed uh, to apply taxes, but we did so, then uh, the taxpayer would get the taxes refunded. That is really uh, the last possibility. And that uh, would now bring us to Sweden. Uh, many of the correction regulations are similar from country to country. We have a tax procedural law, which is similar to Austria and Germany. So when you have an MLC, it needs to be, it should, it has to, these have to be implemented. And we have uh, tax procedural laws for international uh, transactions. Uh, and we also have uh, procedures and regulations for uh, the avoidance of uh, double taxation. And uh, this is very similar to the, to Austria. We have uh, double taxation agreements, and the first double taxation agreement with Germany already took place in 1928. And when I uh, started to work with the uh, fiscal authorities, we also had um, tax legislation from 1928. So it goes back quite a long way. And we have a, a law relating to the uh, Convention for the Effective Execution of the Agreement. And we want to make sure that Swedish companies are treated equally, not in comparison to foreign companies, but that they are treated the same and equally within the country. So we here we have a, an agreement on the equal treatment of companies within Sweden. And uh, we also deal with permanent establishments. And I saw in the program uh, that this will be discussed later in other 
presentations and you can extend that. If you don't come to agreement within two years, you can have a consultative committee and they will try and solve the problems then. So that is what I can say on that. So this is a practical case. And in this case, time we looked at a different case, and two years ago, that was a very easy case. Everything went well. Everybody was happy. And uh, that uh, we closed a deal or a case after two months with Austria, and 95% of all the cases uh, are done in agreement with the companies and all the parties involved, and they work well. Our case now is slightly uh, different. We looked at it explicitly in order to throw light on the other side. Our situation is the following. We've got a German company, a DGMBH as we call it, and we've got an audit instruction for the years 2011 to 2013. And the relationship is between Germany and Austria. And then in the course of this, I found that the German, uh, the, the Austria, the Austrian company has trademark rights and licenses that are being used, and the Austrian company doesn't want to pay the license fees. So it's relatively easy. And it went like that for years. There was never a problem. And in, the, in July 2013, uh, the figurative brands were merged to a German company, the DL GmbH, which was established at that point. And one could say, as a German excellent audit, you could be quite happy because the license fees are only paid abroad. We're talking about millions every year. So, and now it's actually uh, become a domestic uh, process and the f license fees are paid in Germany. Uh, then uh, the audit looked at that in a little bit closer what the effect was in for these two companies. For the new jet company and the Austrian company, as you can see in the German opening balance sheet of the new GAB, um, GmbH, there's trademark rights amounting to 100, 100 million. And then an expert opinion was also presented during that tax audit. and. So this mil um, disjunction value of 100 million would have to be shown in the opening balance sheet. And then, of course, um, we looked at um, the 100 million. And then, then we looked at the foreign companies, um, the, foreign, the Austrian company and the internet. You can, you can check the database and commercial register. And you can find out whether there was a consideration on the other part. And you could see that the value was created amounting to a disjunction value of 10 million. It's not really clear here on the Austrian side. And um, these um, assets will have, are not created on the balance sheet, but the disjunction value shows a discrepancy of 110, which is quite substantial. Now we asked ourselves, how did this value come about? And what happened with this newly established GmbH in Germany? And we found, based on the expert opinion, it was assessed. And according to the expert's opinion, based on 7%. License fees um, were reasonable um, in terms of the license amount. And the company presented that 7% should be all right because as so you pay to a few other third parties, you also pay 7%, but you need to say 98% of the products labeled with that are subject to 3% license agreements, and the two other ones is a niche product where you pay for something that is hardly relevant, you pay the 7%. And so we also thought anyway that um, seven years 7% is not appropriate. Then the subject matter was presented to the Austrian authorities to say that 3% is correct and not 7 
Maybe they could check it again, we said. And one question from the perspective of Austria. 2011 and 2012, where the normal license um, fees um, were paid by 3%, so um, Austria would have been would have had a downside. And um, But we were asking ourselves, could there be any discrepancy in this amount of uh, 100 to 10? And would it be possible that uh, between the disjunction and the other value, that would be a discrepancy. And the question is whether the German um, audit um, would be able to show this discrepancy between entanglement and disjunction. Based on that principle, it is reliable to do this versus uh, based on section 88, whether that is the right value. And of course, this would have, um, we get ever potential from the 100 million. And, and on the other one, you would only have uh, 10 which have been subject to this junction. And um, these are additional income that would be generated. And we asked ourselves, um, could this be any um, a silent or concealed aiding and abetting if the value would be increased? And we also can follow based on the current situation and discussion whether Germany um, would be subject to make balance payments if that would be the case, that this would be called a concealed aiding and abetting. Uh, well, for us, what, what should we do as auditors? Um, should we also clarify the clear discrepancy of the valuation based on sections um, 10 or 11 of the Mutual Assistance Act? Um, or should we alternatively have a joint audit together with the other state? So the case is at the BTSD, and because we're um, sending it through the BTSD, it's currently at the BTSD. And I assume that is going to be clarified within the next few weeks what is going to be done for us. And how did we proceed? And now it's at the BTSD. And we asked the company to provide a statement. Most likely, we would not be obliged to inform the company that we have initiated and sent this procedure to broad based on 114 Section 4. Um, we did it, and the company made a statement. And the statement of the company was, uh, first of all, there is no obligatory correspondence between the disjunction and the entanglement value. And further, it said, determination of the trademark value is no question of fact that is acceptable, accessible for the exchange of information. But it's just a pure assessment. And beyond that, and yet this can be confirmed, the prerequisites for further procurement of information have been fulfilled. The company is otherwise helpful and providing F. The only thing that was not uh, supported, which was not uh, submitted, that is the export opinion that was um, given to the Austrian authorities. But they said it was no longer that relevant. That was the statement. So what is the opinion of the external um, tax auditors? We um, agree that there is no um, obligation between the disjunction and entanglement value, that that needs to be identical. And also Germany, when the entanglement and disjunction values were excluded, that was excluded by law. But of course, um, to, to such a substantial discrepancy, this cannot be only um, exchange rates, differences, or due to different assessment principles. There must be something that relates to a substantial discrepancy. Only this way this can be explained, um, that you have these uh, different values in both states. And as a consequence, we need to so that we intend to inform the Austrian state on the basis of an information exchange with um, auditor secondment. And also the auditors will also provide the information from Austria, this, um, order, this opinion. And that's another important point based on our understanding. If we only had an exchange of auditors and do not have a joint audit, then basically this would be an enough, we would no have any approval of um, the audited company. So that improves our situation, having 
not having to receive a consent. We have a similar case coming from in the um, FG Cologne and for the um, Court of Finance in Cologne and based on legal protection. So we might be ready soon to have a dispute about this question because we don't seem to reach agreement with the tax consultants. Yes, from an Austrian perspective, we have a similar legal basis with Eric Spensberger just mentioned it. Section 3 is as a, a consent of the company, and in Austria, we have the consent of the individual. That means this requires a written consent of the individual that um, in order to become active, to work with the international authorities. Generally, we could say in Austria, we will be able uh, so to work on um, um, domestic taxation and to oblige um, the taxpayer to provide the information. This has been um, simplified by the Austrian um, transfer price documentation law that was enacted since July this year, where the implementation of the of the Section 13, this is of um, national law that uh, follows the re EU recommendations and the OECD com uh, recommendations. CBC reporting and the local file and the master file was implemented. Beyond that, for companies below 50 million, we still have the um, documentation regulations of the BHO. This is the Austrian transfer price um, regulations and anything that is included in that. That means the taxpayer, in this case, would have to submit um, the calculation of the assessment. If that is the case, that we are able to see that there is a much different value, the quite substantially different value achieved abroad. There can only be um, a third party price, so that's either, well, it might be 50 or 100 or 10 million or anywhere in between. And beyond that, and also the rate of the foreign rate cannot only be used 3% or 7%. So most like this will leave, um, be a topic for the past, we should think of. And we know from many of these cases that the relocation of um, trademark law um, rights is done on a step-by-step -step basis, and that will be changed from Austria to Germany, and then it might go to another country. So the spontaneous information would be a suitable um, instrument and we've implemented the spontaneous information in conformity with the EU, similar like in Germany. Only section one or two was um, interchanged, as we found out in section one. We have a current regulation for cases where we have reasons to assume that there's a tax reduction available. And the stepping stone strategy is used where you can use interim countries in order to shorten the procedure. We have cases where the subject matter is seen that there will be tax deductions in abroad. And for those cases, uh, we would need to receive spontaneous information and have to send information to the partner state. But also in Section 2, we have a general regulation that means in cases where we see a benefit for the foreign tax authorities, we can inform the tax authorities abroad. That's why discretion is be done based on the tax auditors and the individual that is taking care of this case and who deals with these cases. And sometimes um, events like this, but also we have um, the Foreign Congress for Auditors in Austria. So this is a good occasion to exchange ideas in order to understand the perspective of the other countries moving away from the case itself, itself without mentioning persons, just in generally discussing um, the perspectives of the others. Um, is there any mutual interest and so? So that would be the first step for spontaneous information and also for simultaneous um, joint audits or MLCs or just the exchange or secondment of um, auditors to the partnering country. Yeah, that is the Austrian perspective. But, well, we're doing it right, and uh, we're on the right way to do Mrs. Ericsson. Uh, she's going back and also to also do the last meetings of our presentation. All right. Sweden has a positive um, perspective and supports international and uh, auditing, which is necessary in this global world.
that we live in. Both as attendance according to Article 11 or simultaneous orders according to Article 12 of the Directive of the Council, and above all, a simultaneous order also without being conducted as joint audit is a highly efficient tool that we keep using again and again. And also, even if we found it necessary, the company will be involved so that we can ask questions, which is very good. And also, we also having a simultaneous audit, quite often we are present in this or that country to get exactly what we need. Because sometimes it's quite difficult, it's so complicated that it's not so easy to solve it, that you just ask the auditor, but instead you need to have rather more details in order to say what you need. And that's helpful because we can do that. Um, I thought we were not complete, and um, we we'll try to be as efficient as possible, and we're going to continue with that. Now let's come to the last part. We would like to give an outlook or summary. So we found in this case that the figures you saw actually quite higher, and then, of course, the auditor would be astonished if you have a disjunction or entangled with 100, and then you have disjunction with 10. And you don't think of often obvious things like double taxation. So rather, we're fighting with the fact that we would have double non-taxation. We can see joint audits are you know, part of the information exchange of how to close these gaps. And we also see that the cases that we carry out, which is 95 of the cases I said before, where we do this together with the taxpayer, where the situation um, is much better for him because the mutual agreement um, procedures take longer. And we can see that this uh, joint um, audits can be done much better, much faster, instead of these mutual agreement procedures. So together we have meetings um, with the taxpayer, whereas in a mutual agreement procedure he would always be left outside. So in this case he's better involved and can cooperate with these developments and cooperate. And that's why for most cases, apart from the one that we just presented, well, for most cases this is a benefit. So mostly we won't receive any different approaches and different results. So. Most cases are being solved by mutual agreement, and if it happens that we do not reach agreement, and these two parties from these um, audits, teams, if you're not able to reach agreement, it's still better because there's, um, the facts and circumstances have been um, analyzed. So the colleagues find it easier because you can look back to a better basis. And that should be called a benefit, and we can see um, legal security within a few months. Just um, I went to Linz in the case, and um, so I think that was will be closed this year for faster legal certainty. So within half a year, we can provide faster legal certainty for the company, and we make sure um, by using um, personal resources to support that. Well, for us, um, so wherever we find and wherever we see where there's difficulties and there will be increased um, term tax um, payment, we have to talk with colleagues so that they're not being closed simply and then would be anything else would be left to a mutual um, agreement procedure. So we are using the obligation to examine the facts of its, um, of its own motion, and we want to use that. And we also mentioned this um, non-permitted aiding and abetting. If we see something that we have covered by per section number eight, so I don't want to be the responsible officer who just provides a limit but um, 
it's easy to uh, claim damages from a um, tax of, um, official, but if you're obligated to and you want to work again in accordance with that, that's why it's so important for us that we have no chance um, to not um, communicate to the outside world. Even if it was a downside for Germany. So let me mention the two positions that I mentioned before. That makes it easier for us to become active. So we assume, we called it um, passive auditing right and active auditing right. What do we mean by that? So first of all, section 10, paragraph 1 or 2 in the passive auditing right where the presence in the official rooms of authorities would be sufficient participation in official investigations. You would only meet the colleagues from the other uh, civil servants without taking the um, taxpayer. And for that case, we don't need the consent of the taxpayer. The active auditing right, though, is different cases on the section of 10.3 and paragraph 12 of the Mutual Assistance Act, where we walk into the company and these cases have been communicated. We can take a look at the entire company and we provide insight into the company's procedures. We can look into the box and also the foreign colleague here can also check, and then also the foreign um, um, entrepreneur does not have to accept that he's being audited by an external auditor from another country. So he will have a reservation of um, consent, and he might um, say no. But in the majority of cases, this does not happen, because mostly the parties see this positive. Open questions are, first of all, um, points under procedural law. So. We are in a process at the moment. We started three years ago, and now we've received a guideline and that has been implemented now in the countries in the EU. And um, to ensure that it works smoothly, then there must be, of course, these procedural laws have to be harmonized and adjusted, even if it's not that requested. But for the tax authority, it will be difficult if we haven't harmonized these things. So if the um, auditing periods are uh, discrepant and if there's statute of limitation and, um, yeah, we're looking at the double taxation and double non-taxation, both should be avoided. And the last point, that is an exchange of information about joint audits. People keep asking us, what about after such a period? And so if you come to an end at X in 2013, can you continue? No rule has been established yet um, of what an APA would be the case. Our impression is once it has been audited intensively, and if you checked everything together with the foreign companies, and if the underlying facts don't change, and if the national requirements do not change, and the national standards do not change, or international standards don't change, there's no reason to deviate from these results. So principally, this should be um, upheld. and. Um, it doesn't have the binding effect for the taxpayer, but also and practically this is going to be the case quite often. And other than that, uh, we will wait for uh, the assistance that we get by this letter. And having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this comprehensive illustration of your experience with joint orders. Especially interesting, I found the statement by Ms. Eriksen, who said that in spite of a legal basis, you uh, do uh, joint audits. Uh, I think that is inimaginable, inconceivable in Germany. In the selection of the case, I have to say that our consultant who's going to give the comment hasn't got an easy task. As always at the forum, we are going to open the discussion with a commentary from the other side. 
i.e. representatives of uh, the economy. Our first commentator for today is a partner with the law firm Peter Schönberger and Partner here in Munich, a very well-known uh, Munich law firm. And he has a lot of expertise in uh, corporation tax, international tax law, transfer pricing, and he works at the University of Chemnitz. The commentator from uh, everyday practical circumstances, Dr. Mr. Alexander Reichel. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Eisgruber, thank you very much for inviting me here and to give me the, for giving me the possibility uh, to comment on the presentation of the previous speaker. As already said, I uh, deal especially with the topics of uh, transfer prices. Uh, so a joint audit uh, is very practical for me in my everyday working life. And at the very beginning, I would just like to say uh, there are two points that are important to me which I want to explain in connection with joint audits. And after that, I want to close with uh, the commentary on the practical case that was just presented to you. The important points that are important to me are the topic, uh, the counter-correction norm in Germany, which is non-existing in case of doubt, and the inclusion of the taxpayer in the joint order process. Uh, on principle, we welcome the instrument of a joint order. We think that it is uh, great if the taxpayer and the tax authority uh, during um, a tax audit work across borders so that mutual agreement procedures can be avoided. These are very time intensive, uh, very expensive for the taxpayers. So it really is a good instrument from our point of view to help uh, the uh, taxpayer give them some legal uh, certainty on both sides of the border. But as we have just heard, there are always situations, especially when uh, the foreign uh, countries approach Germany, where it could be that a joint audit uh, might be uh, carried out successfully. And we've done a, had mutual agreement procedure, and at the end, the, we have to tell the uh, taxpayer, well, the joint audit is over. Now you have to initiate a mutual agreement procedure so that uh, we can change your assessment base in the, to the benefit of the taxpayer. And that, I think, is a little bit absurd. So that is why that I think, especially in view of the inflationary rules and regulations of international change of ex information, exchange of information that are just being implemented, and the country-to-country -country reporting, or specifically the joint audit, in view of all of this, I think one should have an efficient counter-correction norm in Germany, which isn't to the advantage of the taxpayer as well. And, then, and we already heard if uh, the, uh, if we uh, try to use the Section 175A, uh, we don't know whether there might be a statute of limitation that is applicable, one should make sure that a counter-corrective norm would be supported by contractual law which allow an, a, a correction to the benefit of the taxpayer in any case. We are in a situation here where it could happen that one could have, which looks a bit like a fiscal cherry picking, you have a result that is to the detriment of the taxpayer when you say great. A good instrument and good instrument, but if it is to the benefit of the taxpayer, you could have situations where uh, there is no possibility of correction. That's the first point. And the second point is the inclusion of the taxpayer. Mr. Spensperger it said in his presentation quite correctly uh, the joint audit is an advantage uh, for the taxpayer because he's listened to more than in a mutual agreement procedure where he is not listened to at all. And a little bit more is not enough because also for the tax authority, it is not good if uh, the inclusion of the taxpayer isn't given 
Mr. Maho already pointed out, if uh, the tax authorities uh, talk about circumstances and found an opinion uh, on a topic, it's very difficult to move away from that. And if the taxpayer is included at a too late a stage and the assessments uh, take place with ultimately are not in his spirit also in view of certain facts and legal arguments, then uh, it is a risk for the tax authority as well, because if they have uh, two assessments and on both sides of the border and on one side of the border, uh, there is a doubt and that uh, a, a ruling is uh, contested, uh, then one might have a case where there will be no taxation at all if you can't make a correction. Uh, we know what uh, the new standards entail, that, the t and that means that the taxpayer will have a possibility to have a presence, to have a say in these procedures and can exert influence on find on the determination of facts and uh, legal uh, consequences uh, that might be discussed by the tax authorities. So let me say uh, something up on the practical case. Mr. Spensberger, you chose a very good case. The sympathies are very easily distributed, and it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult situation uh, to say that the the way the taxpayer behaved is great. But it was um, interesting to hear you say that uh, the case that you just mentioned and that you want to solve it in such a way by saying we want to have a joint audit without active auditing. Mr. Macho mentioned a Section 8. Section 8 would is a Mutual Assistance Act also applicable for Germany and provides for spontaneous information. And I wonder whether this is a really typical case for a joint audit because it's much more about transporting information to Austria. And I think if you look at the, at the regulation for spontaneous information, I wonder whether this is the right norm. And if you look at the regulation very closely and read it, you could ask yourself, whether an information wouldn't actually be necessary from a German point of view, I think so. And if you look at section eight in paragraph two, there is a standard or norm that says that the German tax authority is under the obligation to transfer information if on the one hand, or if for example, uh, there is a reduction of uh, a reduction of tax abroad or artificial transfer of profits, what is artificial, uh, that lead uh, to tax savings for the company at this point. Nonetheless, I think one discuss about that. And I wouldn't look at the valuation of the trademark as a focal point, but if such an expert opinion that was made in Germany and it says that the value is 100 million based on the license fees, which are meant to amount to 7 percent, uh, probably uh, the license price analogy method was applied, then you have to ask yourself how uh, one said that a 7 percent license fee is appropriate if over many years uh, 3 percent were paid and recognized and acknowledged. And normally, if I did such an expert opinion, I would uh, try to find comparables that prove that. And the question arises, uh, this uh, partial aspect of the expert opinion, i.e. the information uh, in a comparable set, whether that is sufficient information, specifically in terms of the uh, license fees. So I think that the case that was presented here is not a typical joint audit case but rather a case for a spontaneous information. Mr. Macho, you uh, would uh, probably prefer spontaneous information in such a case. Yes, that would be the beginning. <laughs> I uh, totally agree with you. At the beginning, you said one should include oh, uh, both uh, tax authorities uh, should give information and they should be present, then it would be typical that both tax authorities look 
at the situation and appraise it on its merit. I don't uh, think uh, it's correct uh, that one fact comes to 100 million and on the other hand to 10 million. So you could have a ratio of 95, 97, 98, but this ratio, I think, is too extreme. So I would think if both tax authorities worked together, and the wish is uh, that uh, the taxpayer is part of the party is understandable, but from the point of view of the fiscal authority and the tax advisor, a uh, uh, tax order to uh, would, uh, of course, also like it uh, if uh, the, uh, they could be present when the tax advisor advises the taxpayer. Normally, and we are cheaper than tax advisors, aren't we? So uh, we would always like to be there when a taxpayer is advised. In, uh, in Austria, we've got Article uh, Paragraph uh, 2. And uh, we leave the arm's length principle, uh, principle in both uh, uh, directions. We don't have ta we're not going to tax somebody uh, twice if it is for us to decide. And if we have some information, we will take over that information. But for Austrian companies, we uh, very often pay back, even if uh, Germany is very strict at the moment. And uh, sometimes we think that the tax auditors are very strict sometimes on the German side and forget that certain things sometimes don't uh, pay uh, such an important uh, role. And uh, they could be a bit uh, more lenient in many cases, we think. And sometimes uh, they make corrections for 10, 20,000 euros, which I think is, from an Austrian point of view, is not necessary. I would like to add uh, something as well. Um, you're preaching to the converted here insofar as the correction possibilities are concerned. We always want that taxation is only done once. We always support our taxpayer. Uh, if there is a, a risk of double taxation, but our task is, and this is uh, how I understood this morning's presentation, we should also endeavor uh, to make sure that, there's on, that, that there is one-time taxation. And if uh, the financial authorities take action, uh, then uh, we have to bear in mind that we have to make sure that everybody is taxed equally. So we agree with you. Uh, the legislator maybe should give us a proper standard uh, uh, so we don't have uh, uh, an imbalance here. Uh, we already said uh, that we look at the procedural law and the procedural uh, processes uh, that uh, could be accepted, uh, harmonized, and improved. And uh, let's come back to Mr. Hasselt after 50 years. Uh, we've actually changed some, you know, quite a lot of things, and maybe we need more time. We're improving every day, and it will be necessary for us to work here. Let me say something about uh, Section 8 that you just mentioned. I looked at it very closely in terms of this event and this case. And if I remember correctly, it says in paragraph 3 that you should do it within one month, uh, that you hand in the information. Uh, the, uh, for, we've been fight, battling with this for months, so this uh, monthly deadline is over. Uh, there's always somebody who has a different opinion uh, if, if he's a tax advisor. Sometimes you want, uh, we want information. We have this case with the fin fiscal authorities in Cologne, and it is uh, 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 quite uh, possible that we have, uh, we're going to extend this case because uh, somebody will ask for legal uh, mutual administrative assistance uh, there. Uh, so that will extend uh, everything again. And we have to make sure that we can exchange information, even if the taxpayer is not so happen, happy about it. If uh, there is a doubt, I'd like to go abroad, go to the fiscal authorities, and I make sure that everything is done uh, correctly. That is the way I would prefer it. Well, thank you very much.
We are already in the middle of the discussion before I announced it. But I'm sure that there are a lot of opinions relating to this case. Uh, can Who would like to say something? Prof. Professor English wants to say something. Thank you very much. I don't... I have a question of understanding. Does that mean uh, that as far as joint audits are concerned, you would be t uh, exert your discretion insofar as that you would use it if there is no legal obligation uh, to come to uh, some agreement? That is what you said. So in terms of material law, there's no correspondence be between the disjunction and the entanglement value. And in an extreme case, if the Austrians said, in our opinion, uh, it would be 7 percent, and you said, well, actually, it's 3 percent, then at the end, one could have a double taxation, uh, as one could also stick with a, a non-double taxation. Is this something that you would take into account if, uh, legally speaking, there would no be uh, double taxation, you would still try to counteract that. The uh, attempt would be uh, to come to an agreement with the foreign authorities, already mentioned it. Uh, we would have problems for the years uh, 2011 or 2012. Would the um, percentage rate be 7 or 3 percent? And here we would, we would have a discrepancy. And all of those who have dealt with evaluation expert opinions know uh, that this is a volatile. You don't have a specifically uh, correct figure. You, if you assess it, you evaluate, and you always have a certain scope. If I would, instead of sending out, uh, I think it would be better to have a spontaneous information according to Section 8 and to have a discussion with the Austrian authorities and to agree on a value that would be appropriate from both uh, from the point of view of both parties and also include the taxpayer. One uh, question. I can remember uh, there, that there is an EU paper uh, that uh, the state where the asset goes to, in this case uh, Germany, is bound to the evaluation. This is a soft law, not hard law and that the same evaluation has to be taken over. So this is a very clear indication that an exchange between the fiscal authorities has to take place. I think there's no two ways about that. And how that is solved, whether it's done via a joint audit or the exchange of information is a practical uh, case. Is it necessary to have a joint audit if it's not necessary? I don't think everybody is really keen on uh, traveling to Austria or vice versa. Uh, but uh, the evaluation has to be more or less uh, correct. I think that is very important. No comment from outside. Then the next question. Uh, Schmidt, uh, Financial Ministry in Baden-Württemberg. I am not quite sure about the fact what investigation actions are actually necessary. Uh, you from the uh, Austrian and German tax audit, the Austrian tax auditor should actually present the taxpayer with an exit taxation. If, and if the 100 uh, are correct and the uh, German tax office would ha to have to tell the taxpayer, well, uh, the uh, licenses in future will cost 7 percent here because and they will be paid in Germany. So for the taxpayer, these are very un unpleasant results. So already based on uh, the existing facts, uh, the taxpayer should be willing to have a discussion. So I asked me, why do you want to make it have a joint audit? Because basically the ta the facts are on the table. Okay, it would be nicer to know where the real value is or lies. But one uh, could tell the uh, taxpayer here uh, to give the right value, because otherwise he would have to fear very unpleasant results. But maybe I, I don't see the situation correctly. Uh, we thought about that as well. Uh, 
we confronted the tax advisor and the uh, company uh, to explain where the Delta comes from. At the beginning, one said uh, that there is a different uh, uh, evaluation uh, methods that are applied. Um, uh, they use the profit value method, which is inappropriate here, but you could use it as a typical method. And then one would have achieved this uh, uh, amount. And this is how it was presented to the foreign tax authority. And for whatever reason, it was obviously accepted, uh, maybe not knowing the all the facts. Of course, you can say if the foreign colleagues look at that, then they should really look at it properly and correctly. And if they don't look at it properly, but maybe uh, the, the auditor didn't have a good feeling for taxes, didn't look where it was coming in and at what value. And uh, then we uh, came across it, and we can decide whether we're going to take this action or not, i.e. to get him to look at it again, or should we say we'll just let it be. Ultimately, uh, the uh, taxpayer will uh, this was written uh, down for over 15 years, and he will have an alpha uh, potential of a double-digit million euros. It was rounded down considerably, uh, so this is a tax deficit. This is quite considerable. Mr. Spensberg, if I understood you correctly, uh, the uh, value of the discussion, the, the discussion about the value hasn't arrived in Austria yet, has it? If I understood this correctly, there is a regulation uh, that is related to uh, tax uh, confidentiality and secrecy, and I've uh, tried uh, not to violate that uh, these provisions. And uh, I think my employer would be liable to damages. Uh, the uh, taxpayer can be sure that we are treated uh, confidentially. That. Uh, we don't transfer anything underhand. Uh, we are bound by law, even if I don't like the law so much. Uh, but I can't act according to my opinion, but uh, I have to act according to the legal framework. Uh, the case wasn't uh, made uh, public. We had uh, communication with the BZST and the colleagues there. Oh, the, these are the federal tax authorities. The colleagues there aren't always as I would think. Uh, so. Th uh, they just say, well, we go to court and see what happens. And if we lose, uh, then I'll appeal to the legislator to give us a new instrument. If we lose the battle, then no problem. We'll probably win the next one. From an Austrian point of view, uh, uh, if we don't know anything, there are thousands of audits where something is audited and it's considered to be correct without one knowing that it was totally different. And if we don't know anything about it, it's difficult to check. Uh, but if we have suspicions and fears uh, that this amount may not be correct, then obviously we're going to uh, go to Germany and say, what uh, does it look like in your country? Uh, we have a duty to investigate, and that means that we have to check on what happens abroad. If we have such a low value in our country, and we know based on the investigations that Germany has such a high value, uh, then according to the law, We have to ask the taxpayer, and if the taxpayer refuses to give information and say, um, we've got EU mutual assistance agreement, go to the foreign authority. And we can only do that once we've um, ex or depleted all the uh, possibilities within our country. If the taxpayer doesn't cooperate, then we can choose uh, to um, uh, second auditors and have other and uh, other tools and methods. I think the administrative uh, authorities it says first of all one has to do all the investigation within the country and then you have to apply for adm mutual administrative assistance. We uh, try to solve the cases according to the law and order and. Uh, try to get all uh, the parties on board so we can get the right information. And very often it happened that we don't know a lot of the things, 
and uh, things that were presented abroad. And I think it's part of a thorough investigation that we look at all the documentation, what conclusions we draw. In Austria, uh, we have a regulation for that. So if we've got uh, two different contracts, we look uh, which contract was really implemented. And, that, and based on that, the taxation has to be assessed and defined. And if we've got um, expert opinions and we, uh, we've got two, then we would be the third expert opinion. And then uh, if we look at them and this, that doesn't comply with our opinion, we would say so. And we have to ask the taxpayer and we have to give reasons if there are any deviations in our results. And we can use a third party if we want a, a third opinion. I don't know of any case that in the last 20 years where situations between Germany and Austria led to a double taxation. We always found solutions of where we had a fair compromise and transfer prices based on the arms legs the principle are always uh, fair. And we have hard negotiations with the German colleagues, with Dutch colleagues, and, uh, and then we have final uh, discussions with the company. Every party tries to represent its own interest, and at the end of the day, if everybody is unhappy, we have a compromise. So, so everybody has to give up something and concede. The next question. Yeah, the Netherlands were mentioned. Larry van der Love from the Netherlands. I must say, like in Austria, we have the regulation to exchange information with foreign countries if we have the impression that not all every information are known abroad. We used to have a hearing of the taxpayer, so we would have to inform the taxpayer information would be sent abroad spontaneously. Today we don't need to do this any longer. So we can provide this information and send it spontaneously abroad. And in that case, I would definitely ask, what is the value that went out of the country and that is being shown here? That's definitely what I would do. And then the taxpayer will then note later on that and uh, find out that the countries have exchanged ex information and they will definitely complain that we have to have something, Ill um, something that is not lawful. So that might be helpful for the discussion tomorrow. And that's why the situation is much different than before. So, WACA, Federal Court of Justice, and um, you got the information of the exit value of 10 million, and you've got a declaration that starts from an initial value of 100 million. In that case, I understand that, Mr. Macher, you would have an interest in a joint audit, but I don't see why the Bavarians would have a primary interest, because you would have to consider that there is the burden of proof and statement. If you look at your case without any further investigation authorities, and if you just check your case, you should say, like, um, OK, we've got a clear declared, and we have exit value based on assessment amounting to 10 million. and. And if they want to deviate from that in England, then the taxpayer would have to render proof more than before. And if that is not being complied with, then, of course, this case should be handled based on that basis. So the information doesn't seem to be sufficient from a German national's perspective to actually understand or see the necessity that the require that there's requirement for a tax audit of a joint audit 
Of course, um, we discussed this case with our colleagues, and we also have a tax office assessment of the office with um, economists who checked whether this can be checked based on the amounts. So they looked at the German opinion, the foreign opinion submitted abroad was not sent to us. Well, you can always have a dispute about that. Our question is, is also whether Section 8, based on mutual assistance, the information would have to be given. Of course, there was the offer. If you can um, solve it by mutual consent and you would have a deduction of the value, then it would be okay from the company. And um, I personally, everyone who was involved um, still were um, concerned to provide approval. And also, quickly, um, we would have generated a result for two million. That's quite enticing. It's quite nice for auditors. The lower value was one third below the existing value. And but under the bottom line, we said that we will not assume responsibility for that. And I said with aiding and abetting, and I said um, the Section 8 of the Mutual Assistance Act. Of course, we can't close the book if we use 10 million. Then we would have a um, procedure before the financial court. The process would take ages. And we also expect that another country, if they had been informed too late, there would be statute bad, where all statutes of limitations would apply. And uh, we need to stay in a certain time frame that it's still feasible that colleagues abroad would have the chance to still intervene. So the only chance we see that is reasonable is to start a discussion, seconding a auditor that will be done with half an hour day. And, and then also, moreover, we would also receive them um, the assessments from the foreign com uh, colleagues. Then you can also look at the facts and assumptions that have been taken in doing the assessment could be looked at in more detail, and you might come to a different result in terms of the amount. If I got this right, it's more about informing the other state instead of auditing. Your information on the basis of exchanging um, and seconding auditors. Mr. Estera? I really love joint audits. But of course, the perspectives of the taxpayer seems to be quite important. If it's true that, um, that this is a success model that I, duly, that I definitely assume, it needs to be more successful, which can only be done by being more cooperative and involve the taxpayers and also the consultants as well. They're not always that nice, uh, like you said, but, but mostly they're okay. That was my first point, but point two is even more important. So how do you proceed after a joint audit? So what do you do with the effect for the future? How do you provide more certainty? so that the findings you also found can be used for the future as well, and the taxpayer would not be standing and left in the rain. And you also mentioned that in your presentation, what could be done, and um, to have sort of like a consent or agreement, or what does Austria or Sweden say about that? And I know you will never get a full certainty, but how can we achieve more certainty on both sides? Um, it hasn't been solved yet, but I agree that is required for the future. At least um, once the facts in the company haven't changed, so then we would still be able to see the same preconditions. So we still have to work on that, definitely. Well, the tax authorities fully agree with you. From an Austrian standpoint, that is lived practice. Three to four months ago, I was sitting in Mannheim with our German colleagues, and we have the situation that the company was able to live with what we agreed upon. And 
the company was also involved by telephone and the company was available, it's no problem, and also giving us in some information. We're thankful for all information, even if it's our decision, which we be, information we believe or not. They can tell us everything, so it is up left to us to what we believe, but uh, basically we would accept that. And I think it's quite helpful. Whenever you talk about the future, then in this case, um, we've done this with Germany, how to continue what will we do, and the developments of the results is like, what's happening then? And we've developed scenarios, um, three different scenarios, and then also determined in a footnote what happens if that um, occurs and not hoping that the people would comply with that. And of course, we had a simultaneous audit and an MLC, then Germany in that case um, did not um, comply with the simultaneous audit, but tried it in, uh, again instead. And now we are using the footnote that, that we comply with that nationally, but we also recommended to companies that that is Section 218 of BRO. So that is an anticipatory um, information. It's unilaterally, but it costs money. and But it also provides a certain um, legal certainty, but then, of course, you would have to use a, a preliminary proceedings based on mutual um, understanding, and that would provide legal certainty on both sides. Um, both sides. And that should be left up to the um, taxpayer what degree of certainty he wants. And accordingly, it will be quite e simple for us, more expensive or more complicated, or it might take longer, depending on that. There's one thing I really missed today, and uh, we talked about entrepreneurship, but also the um, um, officers, and I keep hearing certainty, certainty, certainty. Life is dangerous. And also, even working on taxes, the more aggressive it is and the more dangerous it is. And you cannot always um, um, provide um, certainty with our limited resources. So that's why you would have to say, well, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to think to what degree you would like to design that, how far you go. and. Um, the further you go and the more um, expensive it's going to be become and with less certainty, which we can only render to a certain degree, and that's what definitely should be considered. That's the right applause, and that is the perfect final word for the first real case report, the discussion we had. So. Let's look into the glass ball and may remember that 2014, so tax forum and uh, commented the first um, tax audit case um, and his comment um, led to a change of thinking in financial authorities and probably this will be the case again. Maybe you also um, have initiated a tax polit policy. So we would like to see in further developments. And of course, if you could continue with the discussion now in the lunch break, that we will have until a quarter past two in the foyer. And I would like to mention two more organizational parts. And first of all, tonight you will have an, a date. We have an evening event, but I will talk about that later. But probably please cancel any private dates you have tonight and please stay with us tonight. And secondly, if you don't find anyone to discuss with, and if you would, uh, once you've um, had lunch quickly, then we have an extra exhibition of the Otto Schmidt um, Publishing House with a few new things from Otto Schmidt Publishing Houses. And you can take a look at the exhibition and a photographer that you might have seen um, prepared a few pictures in that exhibition and you can walk through. Enjoy lunch. See you later until 2.15.